Good evening, folks. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you this evening about uh, a problem that has been the most important, probably single thing for me to understand in my own life in the last 10 or 15 years, and, and that is the problem of shame. Uh, 15 years ago, I knew, what the, I knew the word shame, but I had no idea that, that the major problem in my life was focused on the problem of shame. Because my belief is that until we understand toxic shame and how shame is internalized and moves from being a feeling, which it is, a healthy feeling, there's a healthy sense of shame, we'll talk about that in a minute, to being a toxic state of being so that we can say that a person is shame-based or they have a shame-based identity, that when that happens, that core, that core of a person's life becomes so painful to, to bear that the person must develop defenses, must develop a, a false self. And uh, those of you who watched the series, Bradshaw on the Family, I talked about the soul murder, the lost self, and that this is the great tragedy, the tragedy that Leon Blois talked about, that we're not saints. That is, that we're not the whole people we were meant to be. We come into this world precious children who are just full of life and love and spontaneity and, uh, you know, anytime. Uh, you see a child, uh, a child comes in a room, the sourest person will beam. Uh, children are beautiful, they're innocent, and you and I were innocent children. And uh, so, so how does it happen that you can come into this world and be a wonderful, precious child of God, a precious little person full of spontaneity, what you see is what you get, no pretense. Remember Christopher Marley's poem? You know, that children, the, the greatest poem ever told is one all poets have outgrown, the poetry innate untold of being only four years old. Barn comrade of bird, beast, and tree, and unselfconscious as the bee. Elate explorer of each sense without dismay, without pretense. In your transparent eyes there is no conscience, no surprise. Life's queer conundrums you accept your strange divinity still kept. And life that sets all things in rhyme may make you poet too in time, but there were days, O oh, tender elf, when you were poetry itself. That's that, that's that poem of Christopher Marley that Buckminster Fuller loves to quote, that every one of us were creative artists. Every one of us had this wonderful, feeling, vital, spontaneous life and something happened. You know, some people uh, might call it original sin, but something happened originally or very early on to a lot of us so that we lost that spontaneity. We lost that kind of verve and, and enthusiasm. I mean, there's nothing more tragic than to watch a child who's had the life beaten out of them or the, who has been fear, scared so badly with emotional battering that, that, you know, they're all uptight and they've withdrawn and they, you know, can see the depression in the child. So how does it happen that a child is born and has all this preciousness and this goodness and, and then by a certain point of life, uh, they're shame-based, they feel rotten about themselves, their core belief about themselves is that I'm flawed and defective as a human being. Now, every addict, no matter what the addiction is, has that core belief. If it's eating disorders, whatever the eating disorder is, if it's violence, if it's criminality, the addiction to violence, the addiction to power, workaholism, rage addiction, all the addictions that I've been talking about, whatever the addiction is, it's going to be rooted in toxic shame. It's going to be rooted in toxic shame. The core belief that I'm flawed and defective as a human being. Now, now I like to differentiate shame from guilt, toxic shame. Remember, there's a healthy shame. 
It's a very early developmental stage, the second developmental stage. After a child develops a sense of trust that is greater than a sense of mistrust, a kind of a core of hope that the, that the facts are friendly, that the world is trustworthy, that this is the infant's needs, to have somebody there who basically takes care of your needs when you need them. Oh, you may have to cry for a little while. They may not always be right there with the bottle or whatever, but they'll be there. They'll be there for you. See, when a child has that, he or she develops a basic sense of trust. Now, it is only with a basic sense of trust that you could develop a sense of shame because you have to have an interpersonal bridge. There has to be. So you can't be shamed by somebody that you don't care anything about. If somebody at your office tomorrow called you a name or, or Monday called you a name that you didn't give a hoot about, that's not going to send you into, you know, deep depression. You know, you just say, that's old so-and-so, and who are they, you know, or you may have something choice to say about them. Uh, but, but the point is you've got to have an interpersonal relationship in order to have shame. So the second developmental stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt, where a little kid begins to learn to say no. See, the time to learn to say no is about age two. Now, I mean, we're real behind. Uh, I, I, I believe in the campaign. I, I think it's a good campaign, the Just Say No campaign. But if you're already an addict, what you can't do is say no. Because what defines addiction is to be out of control. If you're an addict, what you can't do is say no. That's why you're an addict. And if you could control it, you wouldn't be an addict. So, so the, the definition of addiction is you can't say no. Now, if the Just Say No campaign is a preventive thing, that's fine. And I think it's, you know, I'm not trying to put it down. It's better than nothing. But I think the problem is much, much more complicated. And I think that it's beginning at about age two as a child begins to separate the terrific twos when their name is no, no, and don't. Uh, you, know, when they, you know, it's like... See, see, they start testing. They start separating and testing. And this is the time where it's so dangerous to get shamed because they're eating stuff and trying out stuff and they're, they're learning to hold on and let go. Potty training, they're learning to hold on and let go. And it's a very confusing time because sometimes you get rewarded for holding on, like in Foley's. Uh, and sometimes you get punished for holding on, like in the potty. Sometimes you get rewarded for letting go like in the potty, but you get punished for letting go like in Foley's, uh, okay? So it's a, it's a very confusing time. It's a time of musculature, holding on and letting go. A child needs to separate, but they need the parent to be there. It's like if you watch a little two-year-old, he'll say, let me do it. And he'll start doing it, but he starts looking out of the corner of his eye to be sure you're there. And if you go in another room, he'll follow you into the other room. Uh, and, and so, you see, in that process of separation, we need our parents to be there. So, so, so as a child separates, he does need structure. He needs what we call discipline, some kind of structure, because he's into uh, his majesty, the baby, Freud said. He's very uh, impulsive and, and prone to temper tantrums and... The danger is over-coercing the child or over-punishing a child. Somehow, it's very difficult to find this middle line. And, and you know, it's, it's what I've been saying all over the country now. The hardest job anyone will ever do is be a parent. The hardest job you will ever do in your life is be a parent. It is a commitment of probably 30 years of altruism, or at least uh, the, the, the desire for that. That is, you've got to be there for that other person. And, you know, as I said so often, uh, you know, 14-year-olds have babies without any training. And you need at least a mother and a daddy for this job. Ideally, some grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, friends to support you in the job of having children. And one of the great tragedies in our country is we've got single women raising five children, three children, all by themselves. 
without any support are single men, but more often single women. I mean, it's one of the great tragedies. So as that little child separates, he needs some kind of balance to know his limits. And what healthy shame is, is knowing your limits. In fact, healthy shame is the feeling that lets me know that I'm limited. If I don't have healthy shame, I'm not in touch with my basic boundary. And I'm going to show you in a minute that addicts have no boundaries because they don't have healthy shame. That, that what, what is an addiction? It, it's not to be able to say no. See, see, a boundary is no, don't come any closer. Boundary, boundary, don't come any closer or me expressing my anger or whatever. That's a boundary. That's, that's, that's something like a boundary is what, what a country has to guard its borders. A person without boundaries is like a country without any borders. A person without boundaries is like a house that doesn't have any windows or doors or locks on the doors that anybody can walk in. So, so very early on, we need to learn to say no. And little children need to learn to say no and need to be given the privilege of saying no within a context. Now, I'm not saying that they should be allowed to dump all over the house, but they need to be able to say no. They need to have that basic boundary and to have that balanced by their own sense of non-omnipotence. I mean, a baby does feel omnipotent, so they need some structure there. It's very abusive not to give a child structure. And children are just as abused by not having any structure. But, you know, the two great errors of parenting are keeping them babies, over-possessing and doing everything for them, or just letting them go. See, one of them says, don't grow up, and the other one says, don't be a child. Don't be a child. Uh, hurry up and grow up so I don't have to take care of you. Don't grow up because I need you to be close to me. I need you to nourish me. I need you to love me and take care of me and value me because I feel unvalued. A shame-based parent might need their children and never let them go. So, so to develop this healthy shame, this healthy shame is the permission to be human. It lets you know that you can make mistakes. It's the opposite of any perfectionistic system. A family that has a rule that allows people to make mistakes and understands that mistakes are occasions for learning. My, my mistakes have been my teachers in life. And if you live life in a context where you can never make a mistake, what a terrible way to live. See, that's a life without any grace. That's a life of law. That's a life of rigidity and legalism. Grace, grace is riding easy in harness. It's like it's okay to make mistakes. We know that human beings are going to make mistakes 15% of the time. And so parents need to know that. Parents need to quit acting shameless. When a parent acts shameless, they act like they can never make a mistake. I have client files where my clients say to me, my daddy would die before he admitted he made a mistake. My mother would die before she admitted she made a mistake. See the shamelessness of that? Parents not in touch with their healthy shame. Man, it's hard to be a parent. We don't have all the answers. We need to corroborate with each other. And when parents are shameless, they're also spiritually abusing their children because they're playing God. Because one of the healthiest things that shame brings you is the realization that you're not God, that you're limited, and that you need help. So healthy shame is an enormously important emotion. With healthy shame, I know that I need help. I know that I'm limited. I think healthy shame is the source of spirituality. It's what we used to call humility. It's also, interestingly enough for me, healthy shame is the source of creativity and learning. I, I did a workshop one time where a guy said, think of a time when you knew you were right. And I got one real quick. It was with my wife, Nancy. Uh, it was, boy, I mean, I just immediately thought of a time when I knew I was right. It was very easy to get that. 
Uh, and then he had us do a bunch of crazy things like go through the, the sequence of when you knew you were right and then you backed it up and then you ran it backwards and it, it was a technique called submodality remapping. But that isn't what I was interested in. I didn't understand it anyway. Uh, what I was interested in is a statement this guy made. He said, when you think you know you're right, you've killed your creativity. If you think you're right, then there's going to be no new searching for information. So what healthy shame does is it lets you know there's a lot more to learn. It lets you know there's a lot more to learn. So it's the source of learning and it's the source of creativity. It's also the source of basic sociality. One man is no man. No man is an island entire in itself. Each is a piece of a continent, a part of a main. If a clod be washed away, Europe is less. If a man dies, it diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for you. See, we're all involved. We all need each other. You know, this is your captain. We're on a spaceship. Nobody's going to get out of here alive. We're all going to die. You know, how would you, you know, we don't hear that message coming across. Not, not a happy message from captain. Uh, but, but, but the point is, we are in a spaceship. We're all hurtling through space, and we're all going to die. I, I mean, th that in itself ought to bandy us together. Uh, you know, and, 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 and sort of, God, let's sing some songs together, what do you say, gang? Uh, and let's pat each other and hold each other and be nice to each other and quit, quit being mean to each other uh, because, you know, we need each other. I, I need some brothers and sisters singing by me when I start thinking of this stuff. And, you know, I'm 54 now and I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. Uh, but the older I get and these things start sagging down, and you, you know, you think about death a whole lot more, you know, than I did years ago. And, and, and so it makes it important what I do with my life. He not busy being born is busy dying. Dag Hammarskjöld once said, you can tell the quality of a person's life by understanding their attitude toward death. See, what, our, our understanding of death will also affect our understanding of life. People who deny death think they've got all the time in the world. See, this is the first day of the rest of my life. This is the time to make up. This is the time to, to, to heal our relationships. It's not tomorrow. Every yesterday is but a dream. Every tomorrow is a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. See, all you got's now. All you got's now. Will you do it now? It never ceases to amaze me how, you know, I look at these photographs in the album and, I, and when we were there, you know, when we were skiing at Dada or when we were on this trip to Amarillo, you know, I never thought we may never go to Amarillo again. Some ways I'm glad we're not going to Amarillo again. Sorry if anybody's from Amarillo, but... But, but my point is that, that when you look at those pictures, you realize probably you never will. And you don't get it that that was it. You know, that was it for Amarillo. And uh, did, did I really look at Amarillo? And uh, I, I remember going on a trip to Glacier Bay. Nancy and I did a cruise to Br Glacier Bay. I was so nervous the whole trip that the only thing I saw was Glacier Bay. I never saw any of the other parts of the trip because I was too nervous most of the time. Hyperventilating and, you know, being hypervigilant and going into catastrophic uh, hallucinations about things and uh, that's not a fun way to have a trip you know so many people live life as if they're riding on a bus but they're riding backwards see when you get excited about the trip is when you're showing the slides right you're going there we are going into the Grand Canyon click click and you know the heart boom 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 and you're all excited. When you were in the Grand Canyon, you were absolutely a basket case wondering if the bus was still going to be there, uh, right? Or if you had the right tickets or... So, so we got to live life while we... How do I get off on all of this? We got to live life when we got it. And, and what healthy shame does is it lets me know that I'm, I need something greater than myself. I need you. I need community. I need love. I need friendship.
shame. Now, how does healthy shame become toxic shame? Unfortunately, it, it, it's, it's a multi-generational thing. Shame tends to run for generations. Some of you have heard me share that I come out of five generations of alcoholism. There's four generations of male abandonment. There are three generations of emotional incest. It's like these patterns are multi-generational. Because shame, once you're toxically shamed, you go into hiding. Shame is about secrecy. Shame is about secrecy. When people are shame-based, they're in secret. See, I, I guarded that I never be unguarded. I lived my life always playing my act and my role guarding lest I never be unguarded. Because always in me there was an idea, if you're shame-based, it's like there's a hunter over your shoulder and the hunter is always coming and they're going to find out. They're going to find out. And, and, you know, what are they going to find out? They're going to find out that I'm flawed and defective. They're going to find out that I'm not what I look like I am. That I'm not the hero or the straight-A student or whatever. Even if I am the straight-A student, they're going to find out. And so there's always this sense of the hunter coming. And, and, of course, then you live life. You live life under great anxiety because of this shame. So, so, so that shame-based people go into hiding. See, it's real interesting if you go read the book of Genesis, there was this garden. You know, this isn't brand new stuff I'm giving you tonight. <laughs> See, there was this garden, and they were not ashamed, it says. They were not ashamed. They ran around naked, which is a great metaphor, see, because shame is about having eyes on you when you're not ready to have eyes on you. Shame is the sudden rupture of experience when the expected is ruptured and something unexpected comes. Like somebody knocks you across the back of the head in church. Or, or somebody screams at you when you had been doing the same thing for two days. Or somebody pinches you on the shoulder and jerks you across a room. Or somebody starts yelling at you and screaming at you. Somebody that was your buddy. Somebody that was your pal that you had this mutual trust with. So as shame begins to take place, see, Adam, Adam, after the fall, they put, they put leaves on them. They go into hiding. God walks in the garden. He says, where are you, Adam? Adam's hiding. See, shame is about hiding. And that's why it's multi-generational, because it, the shame secrets get hidden from one generation to the next. You can hide suicide, you can hide that Uncle Joe's a drunk, you can hide abortions, you can hide uh, deaths, you can hide murders, you can hide financial failure, you can hide all kind of things. And those things dysfunction families, the secrets. You can hide sexual addiction, sexual acting out. Those things dysfunction families. In fact, that one dysfunctions tons of families. There's tremendous sexual addiction and if they're going to be secrets in a family, guess what they're going to be around? They're going to be around sex. So if there's sexual addiction or a lot of secret sexuality going on in a family, that's going to be hidden. Now, families are as sick as their secrets. I'm not talking about privacy. I'm not talking about good boundaries. That a husband and a wife, my wife and I, have a life, a part of our life that no one shares in. That's our private space. It's not mine or, your, or hers, it's ours, and it's no one else's. That's privacy. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, I'm talking about a secret that you don't want to tell somebody because basically you're ashamed of it. You wouldn't want to talk about it because you're ashamed of it. So we're as sick as our secrets. So when children are born into families that, are, that have shame-based parents, they already have two strikes against them. You can't teach someone how to love themselves if you don't love yourself. So my daddy was an addict. My mother was a co-addict. That is, they were in the classic alcoholic codependent relationship. And remember, the codependent is an addict also. The codependent is in a relationship addiction. And, and so here I am being raised by two addicts. They, they did the best they could. They did the best for me they could, but they couldn't teach me to love myself 
because they didn't love themselves. How can my daddy teach me to love myself when he, see, because the job of parents is to model, model, modeling. Children don't know anything. They come into the world and they say, who am I and how do you do it? They need to look to a mom and a daddy who are modeling, here's how you do it. And a lot of you who are come from dysfunctional families, codependency is cognitive deficits. It's just a bunch of stuff you don't know how to do because nobody ever taught you how to do it. You were neglected in being given some kind of structure to problem solve or to have a philosophy of life. Even though at puberty, when you got to be an adolescent, see, one day kids open the door and they puberty on you. <laughs> and this is really weird. Uh, and, they, and then when you walk in a room, they hold up a crucifix, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and they don't want to talk to you anymore. And, uh, uh, you know, you say, how's it going? You ask them questions. They say, yeah, no, yeah, no, uh-huh, okay, uh-huh. They, they won't tell you anything. Uh, and, and they really need to start separating from you. But before that, before that, there, there's all the relationship with them. So if I have shame-based parents, there, there's no way I can learn to love myself. The second way that you, that this healthy feeling of shame becomes toxic and, and becomes an identity, or, or the technical word is becomes internalized. Let me say a word about that. You know some people, I bet you everyone in this room knows somebody that you would call an angry man or an angry woman. You say, oh boy, I know this gal at work. Boy, she's angry. See, she doesn't have anger. She is angry, right? Or he, boy, that guy is really angry. Don't shoot pool with him, you know, or whatever. He's really angry. See, that means that the person has internalized the feeling. They've internalized the feeling. So you can also internalize shame. It's no longer a feeling, it's a state of being. How does that happen? Through shame-based modeling, then through any kind of abandonment. Daddy just is never there. Or mama's just never there for you. See, what you love is what you give time to. Think about it. What we love is what we give time to. If you want to make a little survey of your love, look at what you give time to. And so when children get no time from parents, and that's what they need from parents, children need time, attention, and direction. When children get no time, then they get it that they're not loved. They're worth less than the parent's time. So you could have a daddy there who's, who isn't there. He's, a, he's there, but he's kind of a shadowy figure in the family. He goes to his room, he goes in the living room, drinks beer, watches TV, but nobody gets to talk to him. Never shows any emotion. There's never any bonding with him. That's abandonment for a child. Our mother's there, but she's always hovering over you and, and, and basically using you for her loneliness and her needs. It's her anxiety that she's trying to slake. Like I, I saw a woman at a school the other day and this little boy was about seven years old and she was interrogating him like this. She said, well, who did you miss the most today? Who did you think, did you, how many times did you think about me today? Who do you love more than anyone in the world? Uh, who do you want to be? And it was all, you know, about her. And I, I thought, my gosh, how, this is one of the neediest people I've ever seen. This poor little boy is being set up to take care of this mother. And, and, and I can tell you, when I look at my files, the number of little boys that were put in bed every night with a needy mother. See, there's nobody there for that child. Children need somebody to mirror, to look at them, to be there for them. What we all needed in the first three years of life was unconditional love. You needed a mirror that no matter what you did, the mirror was there. That's why you got to be so healthy to do this. I'm 54 now. I'm ready to have a kid. You know, I mean, but 22, you know, my, I don't even know who I am. I, I, I think God got this one wrong. I'm not sure about that, but uh, please, God, let, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, 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 but, but it seems like it. I mean, we're, we get older and more mature and we get a little financial security. Now we're ready to have a child. But you know, there you are, 19, 20, 21, 22. My mom and dad were 18 and 19. You know, bless their hearts. They did the best they knew how to do. 
and so did your parents. But they just didn't, just there was a lot they didn't know to do. They, you know, were working on their own stuff. Any form of abuse will shame a child. Sexual abuse is the most shaming of all. And remember in the series and in my book, what I'm trying to show people is that, that sexual abuse is much more rampant than we understand. That, that we, we're now understanding that the horror story kind of sexual abuse is like one in a hundred. And when people think of incest, what they think of is the stuff that hits the newspapers. I, I, can, I can give you file after file of people who've been incested. And when, when we get statistics like 60 million victims of sexual abuse in the United States right now, 34 million women are the, are, are grown up women are the victims of incest. We have an enormous problem here. And it is the most highly shaming. It's a setup for a lot of sexual acting out to have been incested. It's a setup for eating disorders. One of the biggest setups for eating disorders is incest. I will never look at a person overweight again in the same way. Not after the work that I've done. Because what I know is that one of the ways that often people try to compensate for having been violated sexually is to put a boundary around them so that nobody can get to them sexually. A boundary sometimes so strong that they don't even have any genitals anymore. It's like a protection. Then the other side of, of being incested is acting it out. Just going through one seductive relationship after another, being used by somebody and left. And so, so a lot of people have incest issues. They're around, uh, daddy was vo voyeuristic, daddy was always staring at you, daddy was making comments about your bottom or your top or saying he wished he could have gone out with a girl like you or made it with you when he was little. See, these are totally inappropriate things. Or there's, there's second level sexual addiction in the family, walking around with, with nudity be, at an inappropriate age. Or certain kinds of nudity where the parent is getting turned on. That's the criteria right there. The criteria is not nudity. It's, is the parent getting turned on by this? Uh, is there some kind of secret turn on going on? The kids are going to experience it. And I could, I could show you file after file where this is the case. Inappropriate knowledge. The person doesn't know anything. They're bleeding and they don't know what's happening to them. I've had female clients who were in their 20s and they didn't even know they had an opening in their body and are in panic because one of them is engaged. See, see the, these are incredible incredible forms of abuse than physical abuse the most common there's no one in here that hadn't been physically abused probably I, I want you to think of something we do not have one piece of data that is proven to us that knocking somebody around helps them I want you to think about something suppose I, I'm your best friend and we're walking along one day and all of a sudden I slug you <laughs> or grab you by the shoulder and pull you across the room or yank your, yarn, your arm out of the socket or tell you to go get a switch because I'm going to give you 10 swats. See, we think that those little people, that doesn't matter to them. Just like incest offenders often think they won't know. She's only three years old. We've seen little girls three years old in projectile vomiting. Uh, they don't even know what's happened to them, but their little bodies are vomiting because they're human beings. See, we keep thinking these are these little, little animals. We're in these rules that are 200 years out of date. They come from the time of kings. The rules we have come from the time of kings. They're not democratic rules. They're not rules that have flowed out of, you know, uh, 200, you know, the, the fighting for democracy that we have done, social equality. They're rules that are master-slave rules. We still have these rules. Man catches his wife in an affair, he gets his gun, he's going to go shoot that guy. But if his wife is having, I mean, if the husband's having an affair and gets caught, you know, we don't see the wife going to get her property back. She's going to blow that girl's head off. I mean, they do, but, but I'm just trying to give you an idea. I hope that's not the Holy Spirit or something calling me here. Uh, uh, but, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, that's not a message from somewhere. But, but anyway, the, the, the idea is that we've got these forms of abuse 
that, that haven't been examined. And, and they, they tend to be multi-generational. These forms of abuse tend to be multi-generational. That is, they'll go on from generation to generation because nobody will look at them. Nobody will stop and say, who has a study that, that can prove that it helps children's self-worth to knock them across the head or, or to pull their pants down and swat them? And, and I'm just telling you, there's not one iota of evidence to support that. There's not one iota of evidence to support that. So, so this is a very, very crucial kind of area. Then emotional abuse, screaming at children. You know, I, I was a screamer in my family, and I got to be, you know, I've got to own how bad that was for my family to rage and scream. And a lot of that was about my not having any boundaries. Uh, this is a mysterious phone. We don't know where it is. Uh, uh, <laughs> About a, a lot of that was about my not having any boundaries. So I would be good guy daddy, let everybody walk all over me until I couldn't take it anymore. And then I'd go crazy. I also learned very early on that I couldn't have my anger. So, so when I felt angry, uh, I, I, you know, I was taught very early on that that was one of the most serious, deadly sins. And uh, so, so when I had anger, I, you know, I found ways not to feel my anger, to pretend like I didn't have my anger. And, and so what I learned to do is be a nice guy. I, I learned to be passive aggressive. I learned to be like Terry Kellogg says, passive aggressive is like a big St. Bernard dog licking your face and tinkling on you at the same time. <laughs> and and I, I, I learned to be those things. So you see, when I got married and I had children, I was this wonderful daddy. I was going to be Mr. Wonderful Daddy. And the kid would walk over my face, but I'm just too wonderful. See, and you don't get angry about that. And, and what I learned to do is to be a gunny sacker. And what you do when you gunny sack, you have this big gunny sack, and every time there's an injustice, you put one in your sack. See, and over the years, it may take years to get the sack filled, but over the years, you collect injustices. And finally, one day, the sack's full. People tell you when their sack's full. They say, that's it! I've had all of this I'm going to take! And they start screaming and hollering and raging. And see, it's like even God would give you a guilt-free anger now because you've had so many injustices. But that was the kind of, that was the only way I knew how to do with anger. I was terrified of anger. I was manipulated by anger. And so I would go for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then all of a sudden I'd just go crazy. Well, see, what that does to children is they can't trust you anymore. How can you build intimacy when you never know what this guy's going to do? You know, for six weeks he's been the Mr. Wonderful. And then all of a sudden he's Genghis Khan. Uh, screaming and hollering and raging and you know and I've talked about rage I have been working for 10 years on rage as an addiction I am addicted to rage rage was a way that I mood altered it was a way that I got out of my feelings it was a way that I could get out of my feelings and feel powerful when I didn't know what to do and, and it's very abusive to children rage is very abusive to children if you don't believe that, watch somebody screaming at somebody else. Stand there and listen to it. You know, somebody outside of your own domain. I heard a guy doing it in an airport the other day. And I just can't believe that I could have ever thought that that was a useful way to be. So rage is very abusive. Name calling, comparing. When are you, you know, why can't you be like you? Why can't you be like? Why can't you be like? You're never going to be like. You're never. See, see remember, we're, we're these precious unrepeatable people, who are they comparing us to? And every time I do a workshop, I tell people, now be careful of your tendency to shame yourself with comparisons. So, so you're at the lecture, and you look over, and she's taking copious notes. And a little voice goes on in your head going, oh, God, I'm not getting it. <laughs> look at all the notes she's taking. I couldn't possibly be getting as much as she is because she's taking many more notes than I am. And, or, or we do workshops, we do healing the inner child, and, and people don't discharge as much as others and think they get it wrong. Because, see, we're always comparing ourselves.
the worst thing of all, the thing that shames people the most of all is perfectionism. Perfectionism is what put, puts people down because you're always having to compare to some norm and you never measure up. If any of you are Judeo-Christian tradition, that's why the law can't save anybody because it's always the law that you're comparing yourself to and, 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 and that's not what it was about. What it was about is I love you unconditionally. Yahweh loved his people unconditionally. Unconditional forgiveness. Build a new ark. Put a mark on Cain. Just keep the thing going. Uh, let them know that I love them. And, and so that's the kind of thing. Now, once all this abandonment, shame-based modeling happens, then a person over a period of time becomes shame-based. Now, when you're shame-based, you feel deep down like you're flawed and defective as a human being. And you have to develop mood alteration. See, because to be inside of me is just too painful. So I've got to alter my mood. And that's where you understand addiction as the basis of all, I mean, shame is the basis of all addiction. See, shame is self-rupture. When you're shame-based, you're not even in yourself anymore. I become an object to myself. As shame-based, a lot of times I can be talking to somebody, and it's almost like there's somebody else here watching. And, and this person's very critical. This person will say, you know, you're, you're, you're sloppy, you know, your stomach's hanging out over your pants. So dip, 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 dip. I mean, it's like a little chatter going on in there. These voices going on in there, shaming you. Or, or you walk away from meeting somebody and a voice goes, boy, what a clutch you are. You know, uh, uh, boy, that, that was nice. Well, I mean, you were really cool, weren't you? You spit on yourself while you were talking. Uh, you know, and, and, and so it, it's terrible. And, and you see, what happens is that gradually these voices become internalized. And then if you feel a feeling, they get shamed. If you feel anger, you feel shame. If you feel sadness, you feel shame. If you feel joy, too much joy, you feel shame. You become shame-bound. I've just finished another book called Healing the Shame That Binds You because we become bound in shame. So anytime you feel a feeling, you see, feel shame. Then if you had shame-based parents, they were needy. So whenever you were needy, they shamed you. I would be willing to bet any of you from a dysfunctional family, the most painful times in your life come from when you were the most needy. And think about that. Because what happens if you have a needy, shame-based parent, when you are needy, they get angry. They get angry. And it's like they will shame you even more. So your most excruciating times will be the times when you were the neediest. Or, or if some of you are in recovery and you go to your parents even now and try to get some support, if they haven't come, gone into recovery, if they aren't working on their shame, they haven't done anything to heal their shame. They will be the roughest on you when you are the neediest. You see, so, so you get all your needs shamed. And there's a lot of us that when we're needy, we feel shamed. Men, culturally, sex roles, we feel a lot of shame often if we're, if we're needy. There's more permission in women in this society for women to be needy. But for men to be needy, gosh. One of the greatest things in my life is a male share, share group that I am in where we talk about being afraid. We talk about being sad. We cry in front of each other. It's been one of the most healing things in my life because what I needed in my life more than anything was a father. My father was a sick guy. He was abandoned by his father. He abandoned me. I felt worthless. My father didn't want me. I never saw my grandfather one day of my life. Uh, I didn't even know I had sadness about that until recently. But, but see, for a child, then you feel ashamed. If you've never been loved by a man, how can you love yourself as a man? And how can I love a woman as a man if I don't love myself as a man? So it's been very healing. But in order to get well from shame, you've got to come out of hiding. You've got to come out of hiding. There is no recovery from toxic shame unless you're willing to come out of hiding. That's why the 12-step programs have worked so well. You know, people walk in these programs, they say, my name is Joe, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Mary, I'm a eating, I have an eating disorder. My name is Sydney, I'm a, a sex addict. 
What are they doing? They're coming out of hiding. The only way out is through. The only way out. In order to heal the pain, you have to embrace the pain. That's the great paradox. Although it's something all the religious masters have said, Buddha's first noble truth was that life is suffering. Jesus said there's no resurrection without crucifixion. Uh, the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt before they went to the promised land. See, I don't know why the world's that way. I'd have saved the world with tennis and golf and nice meals myself. But it uh, doesn't seem to be that way. It seems to be that, that you've got to be willing to come out of hiding. In 12-step programs, you go in there and tell them your worst stuff, and they all give you their phone numbers. Uh, and, and then, by, you know, they, 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 they tell you they love you. It's the only, you know, the only it's the requirement for membership is you have to be screwed up. I like that in a club. Uh, so so how, how do we heal the shame that binds us? A and what do we do? You see, the shame is the issue. If we want to prevent addiction, because an addict feels worthless. And remember, there's a great difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is, I made a mistake. Shame is, I am a mistake. Guilt is, what I did was no good. Shame is, I am no good. See, shame is irremedial. Shame is about being. Guilt is about doing. You can heal guilt because you can do something different. But what can I do if I'm flawed and defective as a human being? See, and I tried all my life to heal my shame with doing. I was the president of class when I was at St. Thomas High School. I was the president of the class. I was the editor of the paper. I was on the baseball team. I was number six academically. I was one of the sickest kids in the school. How many principals would call their class president, the editor of their paper, won nine or ten medals on graduation night? Call this kid in and say, you're really messed up, kid. See, because I had become a human doing, I wasn't a human being. Everything was in performance. I couldn't go inside because it was too painful inside. It had to be outside where you could see it. Look, look at my achievements. How am I doing? Look, look, look at me. Let me achieve. Let me be a high roller. Let me make straight A's. Let me make a lot of money. See, and here's the tragedy of shame, that it's trying to be more than human or less than human. I was in Orlando recently at a cocaine conference. They were talking about the high roller cocaine addicts. I don't see any difference in cocaine addicts. They're just on the high side. They're the super achieving types. The other side are the addicts in the alleys, but they're both shame-based. Straight A student and straight F student can both be shame-based. One tries to be more than human, the other tries to be less than human. So the healing, the healing is to be born in a family where it's okay to be human, it's okay to make mistakes, Mistakes are considered to be times of learning. People don't put you down and punish you because you've made mistakes. Healthy families have laughter and spontaneity. You don't have to walk on eggs all the time because maybe somebody's going to catch you in a mistake and then they'll cream you. You can have fun in such a family because people aren't going to cream you all the time. See, we've got to, if we want to prevent addiction, We've got to stop shaming children. We've got to stop the process of people becoming shame-based. And, 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 and until we do it, and until we understand how to heal shame, at Yale, Helen Block Lewis did a study of 180 psychotherapies. And she found when the therapist, if it was a shame-based person, if the therapist treated the guilt, the therapy went on and on and on and on for years. When they treated the shame, there was recovery. And I'm going to tell you that I went to therapist, I went to psychiatrist, and they dealt with my guilt. They didn't deal with my shame. It wasn't until I hit a 12-step program where I'm John, I'm powerless, I need help. I come out of hiding, I go to these meetings. See, then the healing begins. But you've got to be willing to come out of hiding. You've got to be willing. To, to, to get some kind of healing by coming out of hiding. As long as you stay in hiding, there's no way. And the hiding can be a mask. It can be playing a macho male role or a perfect lady role. It can be delusion and denial. We've got to break down those things. We've got to feel as bad as we really feel in order to get well from shame. You've got to be willing to say, I am hurting. 
You got to wi be willing to say, you know, be vulnerable. And so families where people can be vulnerable, where little boys can bond with daddies because daddy's willing to tell them on occasion, not every day, but on occasion, I'm really scared, son, or, you know, I really feel frightened by that, or daddy be vulnerable, or to see their daddy cry. I've seen absolute miracles happen in therapy when children saw, see, saw a father take down his mask and cry, like during all this unemployment. A lot of men have come to me. I've said, why don't you go to your family and tell them how bad you feel? Quit pretending. You know, let them love on you. Let them bandy around you and support you a little bit. Quit having to be God. See, because ultimately toxic shame is spiritual bankruptcy. See, I'm not human. I don't have to be human anymore. When you're toxically shamed, uh, you're not human anymore. You pretend like you're not human anymore. I, I don't need any help. See, and, and, and unfortunately, us males have been victimized by that kind of stuff. We've been brought up in a system that said real men don't ever show vulnerability, don't ever show emotion, don't ever need any help. The Industrial Revolution has taken daddies out of the house, out of the family. So there's some real serious problems. And, and in, if we're going to heal the shame, we have to be willing to come together and, and to admit that we feel bad, that we're hurting, that we're vulnerable or whatever. So healing the shame that binds you is, you know, or if we were going to set up programs to prevent drug addiction or eating addictions, because all the addictions are based on I'm worthless at some level, then if I have sex, I'll be okay. If a whole bunch of women love on me, I'll be okay. If a whole bunch of men want me, I'll be okay. Or I just get out of my pain by mood altering with fantasies and uh, masturbation or pornography. Or, if I eat, I can fill the emptiness, I can be full and filled. Or, if I buy things, I'll be okay, I won't be so empty. Uh, or, if I drink or have cocaine, I won't be so empty. So, all the rituals of eating, of sexualizing, being on the make, cruising, all the acting out are ways not to feel the pain. They're all mood alterers. Remember, an addiction is a pathological relationship to any mood-altering experience that has life-damaging consequences. So, the healing of addiction is the healing of relationships. I had a relationship with alcohol. I had a relationship with Tuanol and Secondol and Nembutol. I mean, they were my lovers. What I found is that if I would turn to people and if I would share and if I would take the mask off and feel as bad as I felt, that, that healing would come. That if I would just talk about my feelings, that if I could just get in the feelings, the healing would come. So how do we prevent addiction? We have families where people can have feelings and children can express their feelings. They can have the five freedoms. They can see and hear what they see and hear and they can say it. They can feel what they feel and say it. They can want what they want and say it. They can think what they think and say it. See, not a family where somebody says, I know you don't really think that. I know what you think. We know what you think. You know, poor little kid's going crazy. You don't really feel bad. I know you don't really dislike your brother. I know you're not really angry at your father. I know you don't feel that way. What are you mad about? There's nothing to be mad about. What are you sad about? There's nothing to be sad about. What are you afraid of? There's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> See, this is sickness. It's causing broken, schizophrenic, addict people. And we've got to stop it. We've got to change the rules. We've got to be willing we got to be willing, as awkward as it may seem to some of us. Because I didn't even know what a feeling was at, at 40 years old. I ran around teaching courses on intimacy. I didn't have the foggiest idea what intimacy was. Uh, it felt good and it sounded good for me to tell everybody else how to do it. But, but it's so important that, that we get it, that, that a family is a place where we've got to be real. The only thing you don't have to work at is being yourself. The only thing you don't have to work at is being yourself. And that if we can quit reading how-to books and be real, get in our feelings, learn how just to be where I am, express my feelings, express my want, allow my children to have that, allow mistakes to happen, try to make a family a place that isn't so rigid where there's flexibility and people can change. That's what will stop the shaming. And have a relationship with something greater in ourselves and quit acting shameless. 
See, the cover-ups for shame are perfectionism, criticism, blame, righteousness, rage, power. That's the way we act shameless. And when I'm raging and righteous and powerful and criticizing, you have to carry the shame. And preachers do it and politicians do it and parents do it. And that's how we're shaming people. And when we shame them, we're killing their souls. See, every single one of us were born in this world a tender elf. We were poetry itself. We all had our feelings available to us. We were spontaneous. Our public self and our private self were the same. What you saw is what you got, and then something starts happening. Don't laugh like that. It's not ladylike. You don't really feel sad. Pretty soon that, that little inner child in you just begins to shrivel, and you become a, a, an act and a performance. And see, what a tragedy to go to our deaths and never know who you are because you get addicted to those roles. So I call you tonight to really think about this and to really be willing to take the risk of embracing your pain. The only way out of the pain is to embrace it. Take the masks off. Get somebody and talk to them and, and allow them to see you as you really are and let them embrace you and love you like a brother or sister. That's what will heal us.